And uh, we're here today to help uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, DCED, to, uh, to present to you uh, some changes that are occurring in IDIS associated with the HOME program. Uh, I'm joined today, let me uh, get my slide here, I'm joined with, uh, with Tina Powell of DCED. Would you like to say hello, Tina? Hello. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we also have uh, Chantel Key, who will be providing technical support if you have any audio problems or uh, if you can't see my screen, so on and so forth. So uh, welcome. Uh, we should be, uh, we'll be presenting material for about, uh, about an hour. And then we'll have lots of time for additional questions at the end if you do have any. And I really encourage you to uh, ask any questions that you have. Uh, now is the time to, uh, to kind of wrap our brains around grant space accounting and, and what it will mean to us and, uh, and how, do you, how things will change because uh, change is always hard. But uh, we want to make sure that you have the resources available and uh, you know where to go for your answers. So let's, uh, let's get going. Uh, just a couple of technical uh, items on the webinar. Uh, all of our lines will be muted, and that's just so uh, everybody else can hear. Uh, we do want uh, you to participate. There will be some uh, polls we'll be including, so uh, make sure you participate in the polls. And uh, also, we again, we would like you to ask a lot of questions. Uh, make sure that you get your questions asked. And the way to do that is in the webinar toolbox you should see a panel, it may be closed, it might be shrunk down, just click on the little plus sign next to it uh, to go ahead and open up that questions box and you can type your questions in right there. Uh, we have one more staff person joining us, uh, Shauna LaRue. Shauna will be summarizing and, and watching that question box and will be pausing throughout the webinar and at the end to get all your questions answered. Okay, so you can also use that question box in case, uh, again, if the audio is not coming through, or if you're having technical problems with your uh, with the video, so let's get going. Uh, our agenda is pretty simple. Uh, we're just going to kind of talk about the background of grants-based accounting and how it's changing, and then we're going to go through a couple of slides in terms of what those changes are going to look like, both on the paperwork that you receive from DCED and also within IDIS. We'll uh, finish up just going over a couple of reports and how those may change and how you can use the reports to just kind of self-monitor to make sure that you are selecting the correct grant years when you're, when you're doing your data entry. And again, we'll, we should have lots of time at the end to do a wrap-up and uh, answer any remaining questions that we do have. So we're going to start off with a quick poll. Uh, Number one is, uh, why do I need to know all this, uh, this hoo-ha about uh, grants-based accounting and, and FIFO and, and what's changing? So why do I need to know this? Uh, these are your four choices uh, to keep uh, Pennsylvania in compliance with the action plan and the CAPER, to prevent repayment by using the incorrect funding year, uh, to make Tina's life easier, that's always nice, by doing things correctly the first time, or all of the above. So Chantel, if you could go ahead and open up that poll and uh, give people a, a few seconds here to, to vote and contribute. About 75% of our participants have um, voted, so we'll keep it open for a few more seconds. Great. Okay, I'm closing and sharing the results. And we have 2% uh, voted to keep PA in compliance with the action plan, 0% to prevent repayment by using the incorrect funding year, 2% to make Tina's life easier, and 96% all of the above. Yep, and that's, that's pretty much the answer we're looking for here, folks. Uh, it's going to touch on a little bit of, of everything. Um, Grants-based accounting, again, it's, it's not going to be rocket science. But uh, we want to make sure we do it right the first time, uh, just so we avoid uh, any complications. The big thing about grants-based accounting is a lot of the tests that HUD uh, checks for, for compliance for the Commonwealth's programs, they're all based on this grant year. So things like the commitment test, uh, expenditure test, 
uh, it's all going to be tied back to this grant year. So if we are attributing projects and activities to the wrong uh, allocation, that can potentially uh, upset some of those compliance tests. So we want to try to make sure we get it right the first time, uh, and that way uh, it will just be the whole, the whole process will be a lot smoother. All right, so uh, let's continue on. And uh, just a little background. Before grants-based accounting was implemented, the IDIS system worked on what was called a first-in, first-out basis, also abbreviated as FIFO. Uh, so essentially HUD started this grants-based accounting with your 2015 allocation. Now, that's not to say FIFO has gone away. There, there's going to be a transition period until we spend all of the funds prior to 2015. So we're looking at our 14 grants, our 13 grants, our 12 grants. And I think uh, State of Pennsylvania, they're somewhere in that, depending on which, uh, which funding type you're, you're using, you know, we might still have some older balances available. So we're going to have to burn through all of those older balances before FIFO goes away completely. And that's one of the things we want to talk about is, you know, what will it look like when we're operating on FIFO and what will it look like in IDIS when we have made the switch to grants-based accounting. So the way FIFO worked is regardless of what kind of information the user put in the system, uh, HUD would draw the, the dollars, they would credit that disbursement against the oldest grant fund available regardless of what you put in. Uh, and that's what essentially, at the, you know, at the heart of the matter, that's what grants-based accounting is changing. So when you actually fund an activity from 2015 and you specify it's coming from 2015, then that drawdown will come from the 2015 grant. It sounds simple, but for, again, for a long time, the system didn't operate on that. They would pull the oldest funds available. So. Uh, it's, it's really going to come down to this, uh, this field that you select on the funding screen. That's what it's going to tie your, all your activities to, uh, to a specific allocation. And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that and discussing that. So again, you know, in, uh, in summary, first in, first out is not gone away completely. It's still there for your older grants for 2014 and older. Uh, and grant based accounting you'll only see right now for 2015. Once you get your 2016 grant, your 2017 grant, all of that will still be on grant based accounting. But uh, until those older funds, we're going to have a, a combination of both FIFO and grant based accounting. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is just kind of quickly go over some of the paperwork that, uh, that hits your desk as you implement uh, these home funded programs and also uh, some of the changes in IDIS. So some of the things um, that will be uh, changing or have small revisions to in, in regard to uh, the paperwork will be the, uh, the program contract, otherwise known as the blue back, uh, a letter that DCED sends you uh, known as the IDIS setup letter. And that's going to be the key document, folks. That's really going to drive all of the data entry uh, into IDIS. So whenever you're doing IDIS data entry, make sure that you have a copy of that on hand and use that as your, as your guidance. And then also the invoices that you're submitting. Uh, under IDIS, there's a couple of different places where we're going to see uh, program years uh, show up. Uh, and that's under activity setup and funding, uh, when you're requesting drawdowns, and then uh, not so much for reporting accomplishments but uh, for, for the home program, but we do want to distinguish between uh, reporting accomplishments for home and CDBG. There are some timeliness issues uh, that you need to consider with home, not so much as dividing out your accomplishments by, by program year that you have to do with CDBG. So we'll touch on each one of those. So this slide here kind of tries to correlate the paperwork that you see uh, with the information in IDIS. So it all starts with uh, DCED will send you uh, your home contract, and in this case, it's a 2015 contract. And in that contract, once that contract is executed by both DCED and your organization, then they will return that executed contract, and alongside of that, they will send you what's called an IDIS setup letter. It will include you know, when the funds were obligated. They'll also specify 
um, an IDIS project, in this case 2015, uh, number 110, and funding amounts, in this case $470,000 that will come out of an SU subgrant, and then everybody gets some admin too, so $30,000 coming out of an NAD. So when they do this, essentially the state will come in and they will set up an IDIS project to reflect that home contract. So the contract and the project are, are fairly, you know, correlated, but the state's going to be doing that part for you. It will be up to you then to go and come in and set up IDIS activities per the home rules uh, and associate them back to that project. So something, I don't know if any of you were on the call with us when we did the CDBG uh, webinar a couple days back, but the rules for setting up home are different than setting up CDBG, right? So one of the big rules with home is you need to set up a separate IDIS activity essentially, usually, for each property that you're assisting. So this activity represents not the entire, uh, in this case, homeowner rehab project, it represents one property assisted through that program. So when you set up your activity, again, you're going to tie it back to this project that was specified in your setup letter. And then when you go to fund it, you'll also fund that activity from that same allocation specified. So if they're specifying $470,000 of SU, you would fund that out of 2015 SU. Same thing with admin. That admin was coming out of 15. So when you fund the activity, it will be coming out of 2015 AD. All right. So again, we're going to see some of how those those accomplishment years play out. Or I'm sorry, not accomplishment years. Uh, those program years play out. So most of the times, these numbers this year here and this year under funding will be the same. However, there may be cases, and this is again why why we're having this webinar that these numbers will be different. It could be that maybe you're funding a rehab uh, partially out of one contract and partially out of another. So another thing to distinguish between home and CDBG in terms of the setups is also the accomplishments. So uh, where CDBG, you have to break out your accomplishments by when those accomplishments occurred. For home, you really only need to do your accomplishments once that activity is complete i.e. all of the work has been done and all of the expenditures have been uh, processed, at that point you're going to have 120 days to mark that activity as complete in IDIS. So it's more based on when the work was done as opposed to program year. So um, just uh, to kind of tie back to some of those, uh, you know, what does this project screen like look like and what does this activity look like and what does this funding screen look like, we have a couple of screenshots, so let's go through those. So when you're setting up your activity, um, and actually we got the wrong circle here. The circle needs to be <laughs> here under plans, projects, activities. Let me uh, fix that real quick. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. So we're under plans, projects, activities. This is when you would be setting up your activities, and again, you're setting up a separate activity for each property you're assisting. Uh, so you're under add activity. And the very first thing you do, folks, is you need to select which project that that activity is going to be associated with. And again, this information is going to be coming from that IDIS setup letter. Again, very important. You should have a copy of that at your desk when you're entering this data into IDIS. So this is where you'll go ahead and tie that specific activity to a specific year is through by, by selecting the project. The funding year, this is on the activity funding screen. So this would be under this section of IDIS, the funding and drawdown. And you, this is the screen that you actually go ahead and commit the monies to. So here you can see the program year. This is the program year selected for that project, so the, at the activity level. And then this is basically uh, a screenshot of what the first in, first out, basically the pre-grants based accounting will look like, is where all of the money is kind of lumped together under this pre-2015. It's not broken out year by year. And you'll actually have to specify, uh, you'll have to type this in, which grant year it should be attributed to. And again, 
that should be listed in the IDIS setup letter. You want to go back to that IDIS setup letter to specify what grant year those funds should be attributed to. In most cases, it's going to tie back to that same program year. In some cases, though, it may be different. So uh, that IDIS setup letter should specify uh, if there's going to be any differences. Okay, um, the final screen, accomplishment year. Again, this isn't tied to any specific year, but uh, we just want to make sure that you understand that this, uh, this data needs to be provided within 120 days of the final drawdown, and that's mandatory under the HUD regulations. So um, this is just the first screen. There's also a couple of other screens that uh, show up on page two, cost data, beneficiary data, and property data. We'll have screenshots of those a little later on. Um, and we'll actually go into the system and play around with the data too, so you can kind of get a feel for what it looks like really in the system. Okay, so um, we want to kind of spell out two different examples. Now, before we get into that, why don't I uh, turn it over to Shauna for a second and just see if any questions have come in through that questions box. No questions at this time, Bill. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Shauna. I'm going to keep on driving on, but folks, again, if, uh, if I'm going too fast, if you want me to circle back to anything, um, please make use of that question box and uh, make sure we get your, your questions asked. Uh, chances are, if you have that question, uh, at least 10 other people on the call probably have that same question. So again, we're going to go through a couple of examples. This is the, the, the more simple one, where you basically just have one contract in place. Uh, and in the second example, we'll talk about, well, what happens if I have more than one contract? Maybe I got uh, a rehab contract from DCED in 2014, and I have one in 2015, because uh, chances are that that might uh, affect how things are, are set up in the system. So in this, uh, you'll see that it's fairly simple. You have a 2015 contract. It was, uh, you re once that contract is executed, again, uh, DCED will send you that IDIS setup letter, and it will specify an amount in the year in the project that those amounts should be associated with. So in this case, the project ID is uh, associated with 2015, and it's project 131. So the state will come in and set up that project 131 in 2015. It's going to be up to the local grantee to add those specific activities that reflect specific project, I'm sorry, properties, and those activities are going to tie back to that project that the state, state set up. They'll also come in, and when they fund that activity, they will fund that activity based on the information in the setup letter. Once all the money's been spent uh, and the work is done, they'll come in here and report the accomplishment data, uh, and essentially, again, it's based on a timeline. You need to get that data in within 120 days of that final draw. So once you've spent all of that $25,000, you need to come in and mark that activity as complete, and before you do that, you provide your accomplishment data within that 120-day time frame. Okay, so um, this screen, is, we just didn't have a lot of screen space, but essentially, this activity, again, is just representing one address, in this case, uh, 400 North Street. Uh, if you were going to do 10 different properties, you would actually have 10 different activities all associated with the same project. Okay, so let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. And this is just kind of highlighting the tiebacks. Again, 2015 is tying back to that setup letter. And the funding, as well, is tying back to the funding letter. Okay, so what happens if, uh, in this case, Indiana County, let's say they got money in 2014 for some homeowner rehab. They also got money in 2015 for homeowner rehab. So you can see that the contracts are reflecting the, those uh, when the awards went out in 14 and 15. Now, here's an example where the funding for, uh, on, in the setup letter, it's not coming from the same year that you got the contract. It's actually reflected back to an older allocation. So again, this is kind of the heart and soul of your IDI state entry. You want to use the setup letter uh, and not necessarily the information in the contract, in the blueback. Uh, so here you can see that the, uh, the letter says that money should be coming out of 13. It's coming out of 13. 
So the IDI's project is reflecting that, and the funding is also reflecting that. So here's the scenario where, okay, let's say you've burned through all of this $470,000 except for just a small amount. So maybe you've, you've, you know, the 10 other activities you did uh, have used up $469,500. So when it comes around to uh, addressing 31 Spooner Street, there's only $500 left. You're still going to do Spooner Street, but you might have to take a little bit out of this contract and a little bit out of this contract. Now, for CDBG, if that's true, you would actually set up two separate IDIS activities. Home has different rules. Home says, if I'm going to address 31 Spooner Street, if I'm going to give them a home assistance, I want all of that home assistance to be reported under a separate or a distinct IDIS activities. I cannot have two separate addresses for Spooner or two separate activities for Spooner Street. That's against the home rules. So in this case, I'm going to have one IDIS activity, and I think I don't know if the DCD has come out with hard and fast guidance, but it's probably best just to associate it with the oldest project uh, involved in the deal. Um, as long as you set it up just once, I think you're going to be fine. But um, once I'm done with the screen, maybe we'll break in and, and Tina can express an opinion on, on which project to associate it with. In this case, we associated it with the oldest project. And on the funding screen, when you come to the funding, you're going to come to, uh, it's going to say available to commit, and you're only going to have $500 in this older grant, which means if you want to fund it for the full $30,000, you have to pull the rest of the money out of 2015. So in reality, this activity is going to be tied to both contracts. But again, in IDIS, IDIS is a reporting system. We have to follow HUD's reporting rules. We can only set it up once. So this activity is not going to be split between the two contracts. It's only going to be one IDIS activity and the funding will be split on the activity funding screen. Um, if this isn't making too much sense, I'm going to walk through the example in IDIS itself so you can kind of see how that plays out. Hey, Bill. So, so yeah. the question coming in is, is um, this slide shows a setup letter of funding from 2013 under a 2014 home contract. Basically, right, right. So, Tina, I'm sorry, was that you? Did you want to break in? Yes. In this example, uh, we had some older funds available, uh, so we had set them up in a 2013 project, but the home contract was not issued until maybe early 2014. So due to timing, we used our 2013 allocation to fund that 2014 home contract. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the point to raise here, folks, is really use that IDIS setup letter to guide what you're putting into IDIS. Even if you get that contract in 14 or 15, the setup letter may distinguish that the state had some older funds that they need to reprogram, and therefore you're getting some older funds. Um, so, you know, really use that IDIS setup letter as your driving force when you're entering data into IDIS. That's a good. That's a good question. Any others out there right now, Shauna? Um, not at this time, Bill. Okay, great. Uh, Tina, did you want to uh, chip in on um, which project to associate uh, this activity with if it's kind of coming under both contracts? Is there a rule of thumb to maybe use the oldest first, or does it really matter? Yes, in this example, uh, we wanted to use the 2013 project when we, uh, you will talk about it a little later when we're looking at the PRO2 activity summary report. Because of the way the home program operates differently than CDBG, we can't separate uh, one activity between two IDIS project numbers. It would be so much easier if we, if we could, but uh, the reason in this case that we are using the 2013, if you look at that PRO2 activity report, it will show that you are overfunded and overdrawn by 29500 And I understand that is not the case. 
so the reason that we are using the 2013 is just so that it will show that the funds have been fully drawn in the 2013 contract, and then we would go on to explain why uh, it appears that you are overdrawn on the PRO2 activity report when in reality the funding was split. And using grants-based accounting, it will get a lot easier to see the split, especially when looking at uh, the, the other reports that are available. But until we can get to that point, the PRO2 would not be the best uh, representation for your uh, program funds. That's a, that's a very good point. The PR2, if you would want to have to reconcile, you would basically have to identify, you know, because one, one project summary would be under by that 29.5 amount and one would be over. So it, it could balance over all years, but uh, again, that definitely adds a level of complexity to it and it's not just going to be clear cut looking at one number on that PR02. And, and Bill, good if point. I may jump in quickly. Uh, the sure. Another issue about this particular activity is that what, because you are splitting it between those two contracts, you will have to follow the contract conditions of both contracts. So watching the timeliness of that older contract, uh, you will need to have that 31 Spooner Street not just drawn down, but the uh, homeowner uh, in the home and the rehab finished and the certificate of occupancy issued. Uh, so that all goes back to that earlier contract. It's not good enough just to spend the funds. You have to get that house completed within that time frame. Very good point. Thank and, you. And Bill, we have a follow-up question. Um, if I'm uh, on this scenario, if I'm invoicing 10000 on this activity, what contract year am I putting the invoice on? That's a good question. I'm going to throw that back to Tina. I imagine you would want to specify that it is split between two years uh, if that one particular invoice is actually split between the two different uh, the two different contracts. You might even set up, uh, and Tina, this is up to you, they might even have to submit two separate uh, invoice requests, one for each contract. And, and that is, I, I would agree with that process uh, that you will have to set up, uh, submit two invoices for that single activity. And uh, because it will be coming out of two different allocations. So uh, until we would revise the invoice form under grants-based accounting due to the um, scenarios, uh, the current process is that you will have to use two invoice forms for this single activity if splitting it between two contracts. Good point. Um, I'm just going to take a little note here real quick. Give me one second. Folks, we are going to be putting together um, uh, an FAQ of frequently asked questions um, to kind of address some of these technical and, and procedural things uh, that may, again, change because of grants-based accounting. So that was another purpose of having this call is just to be able to gather a lot of the kind of questions on your mind. So please, 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 I just I want to reinforce that, uh, you know, if you have a question on your mind, uh, let us know, and then we can uh, include it in the FAQs as well. And, uh, and I think it will help all of the grantees out there who are administrating administering home funds within the state. So good and question one so far. More question. Oh, oh, great. <laughs> Prior to 2015, we did not assign an IDS number. The state did. So I assume assigning two funding years to one activity is new for 2015. So Tina, is, is, so you guys actually would set up the first screen on activity setup? Is that, is that what happened? Uh, prior to 2015, we were and, and still are under first in, first out. Uh, and so what we would do at the state is that we would take whatever funds we had available. Uh, and I admit we are still moving funds around between the allocations because Pennsylvania needs to get those oldest funds used first. So, uh, in fact, we have some 2009 funds still sitting out there. They will be expiring in September. So what I will do in IDIS is I will 
move the funds that you currently have in a contract for whoever is drawing the funds next and make uh, you use the older funds available and then uh, so any new contracts that we would issue would have a longer time frame to spend. So under grant-based accounting, this gets particularly tricky because the funds will always stay in the 2015 year, the 2016 year. So uh, it could be that we are still stuck to those time frames. Uh, so if you have your four-year contract, you decide you don't need all the funds, maybe you left $20,000 out there, uh, then if we were to give that those funds to another grantee, they would have less time to spend it. So they may only have a year to spend those funds or two years. So it is very important to watch the timeliness uh, because I won't be able to keep those funds in Pennsylvania like I do now uh, by moving the funds around uh, and because of the first in, first out. So they are going to be stuck in the allocation that uh, is issued. Um, so again, when we were talking about issuing the older funds available, in this case 2013, uh, those funds, when you draw against the activity, you'll have the $500 out of 13 and then the $29,500 out of 15. If that homeowner would then become ineligible, uh, then we would have to talk about repayment. And the, when we repay the funds, they won't, uh, the funds will be split. Some will go back to the 2015 allocation, some will go back to the 13. But the 13 funds still follow that earlier expiration date. So that's an additional challenge that we have at the state. So we have a clarification that um, the question that was asked, and I can read it with this clarification, it's about the activity number? The activity number we do not assign. So I'm, I'm a bit confused there. We set up the IDIS project number. We do not set up the IDIS activity number. Okay, so this is something maybe we have to follow up on and, and talk to some of the program managers because I think I think I have seen a setup letter that actually did specify activity numbers, but uh, maybe that was a special case. And that would be in the CDBG grant program. We would okay. We could do that, but in the home program, we do not know your property address until you complete your environmental review, and then the onus is up to each grantee to set up their own activities. Okay. Does that answer the question, Sean? And if, folks, if you do have follow-up questions, please, again, just, just keep them coming. I think we're okay for now. Okay. Okay, very good. So uh, this is what I'm going to do, folks. I'm going to go ahead and get into IDIS. It's just a training region, and I want to kind of show you uh, some of the screens that uh, that we've been talking about and, and how it looks in real life. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to IDIS and of course I have to log back in. Bear with me for one second. The system, especially the training, has been a little bit slow lately. So I'm going to log in to, uh, to Sunbury. And so we're going to start from scratch. We're going to assume that you just got an award, congratulations, uh, and you have your pro program contract all signed and ready to go. You have a line out the door of people who, who need housing rehab. So uh, you get everything, everything ready. Uh, you got your commitment. You got uh, your scope all, all set up. So now you're ready to go into IDIs and set up that activity. So we would come to Plans, Projects, Activities. And what we want to do here, this screen will just allow you to search for activities. Uh, I'm going to come over here to Add. And again, the very first thing I need to do here is select a project. And this, so this is going to tie it back to uh, a specific, uh, in this case, uh, allocation so the the, the um, you would look at your IDIS setup letter for that project in this case I'm just going to use my search criteria to uh, to limit it to home and then hit search whoops maybe I don't want to do that system can be glitchy uh, I'll go ahead and just do it for 2014 okay uh, maybe 
I'm just going to do it all because I'm looking for home and I don't see it. There, there's 15. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose 15. So that's what you do. Um, I'm not going to actually go through and, and set up uh, this entire activity. What I want to do is uh, I actually have one set up. I'm just going to uh, show you uh, what it looks like once it's been set up. So here's the Spooner Street. Ten bonus points for anybody who actually knows who lives at 31 Spooner Street. You can uh, go ahead and submit that into the question box. I'd be interested to see if anybody knows. A little uh, TV trivia here. But again, you can see it's uh, set up. It's assigned with a, a home project. Uh, and I went ahead and assigned it uh, an activity name. Um, one thing that DCED is looking for is they would prefer you not to use the, uh, the recipient's name. So if uh, Miss Jones lives at uh, Spooner Street, don't put in uh, single family rehab Jones. They would much rather prefer that you use the address as the activity name as opposed to the beneficiary's name. Under home, I went ahead and chose homeowner rehab. And uh, I assume that the environmental review was complete. Um, one thing we did, and prior to this uh, this webinar, is there there has been a little back and forth in terms of whether you should be even setting up activities in IDIS uh, until you have that environmental review complete. Um, uh, HUD hasn't made a, a hard stand on it yet. Uh, in one of their most recent webinars, they they encouraged you not to set up the IDIS activities until that environmental review is complete. Um, I think what's going to happen is as HUD implements this new system, this HERO system, which is all about the environmental review, once that is fully online and is required uh, to be used by all of the, uh, the, the home recipients out there, um, they're really not going to pay too much attention to that. But uh, in the meantime, you know, uh, it, it, it's probably a fairly good idea not to set up your IDIS activities until the environmental review is complete. That's kind of the guidance that has been coming from HUD. But again, it's, it's not essentially full-on official yet. So we have an activity description here. Um, and in, in order to get to ready to fund, you know, until, until I won't be able to fund until I come down the setup detail page. So I'm going to click on that. And this is, uh, we're not going to go into great detail, but this is the type of information you need to provide before you can set up the activity. Um, you have the homeowner's name, the address, an estimated number of units, the estimated cost. You hit save and continue. And once you have pulled out that first page, it's slightly different when, for, when you're doing home buyer or any rentals. But for homeowner rehab, that's all you have to do. You come back, you see it's ready to fund. And I'm going to just use this one little shortcut here and click on Activity Funding. And so and now I'm under my Funding Drawdown section of IDIS. I just used that little shortcut. And what it's doing here is it's listing the different fund types I have available. So here you can see uh, since I'm logged in at Sunbury, um, the recipient names of Sunbury, of course, your, your name, your organization will be listed here. And we have two different fund types. We have AD and we have SU. AD being for administration and SU being for subrecipient subgrant. Uh, I have my available for funding. And then in order to actually fund this activity, I could come in here and use add edit. In this case, since this is an actual hard cost rehab project, I want to use SU as opposed to my, my admin fund. So I go ahead and click on that. And now we get this big scary message about going to jail unless we're doing everything ready or correctly. So uh, make sure you read through that and you uh, ensure that you actually do have a commitment to a home eligible project. If so, you're going to go, go ahead and click I agree. And so this is where the rubber hits the road, folks. Um, up here is just a summary of the activity I selected. Um, but you can see that the funding has been now divided into two different distinct sections. Um, this line item up here where it says pre-2015, that represents all of your allocations before 2015. Uh, so it's absolutely named pre-15. But if you had some 13 funds, some 11 funds, 12 funds, 
those are all going to be kind of jumbled together into this one line item. So if your IDI setup letter says anything coming before uh, 13, in this case, let's say it was from 11, I don't know if you'd be getting 11 funds at this date, but we would put in 11 here based on our IDI setup letter, and we would put in, uh, let's say, $10,000. Once you do that, you hit save, and then that means that all of this activity is going to be tied to this specific fund year. Uh, if it was one of those uh, activities that's going to, or properties that's going to soak up the balance of funding from pre-15, and then maybe, let's say, the rest of it is going to be funded out of 2015, it may be split funded like this. But again, this is the, the exception rather than the rule. Chances are um, the activity would be fully funded out of this one year. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so this activity, all, all that's funded is tied to 2011. Now when I come in to, uh, to actually do the drawdown, I'm going to hit create voucher and I believe that activity number was 47359. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up that activity. So it, here it is, and you can see that the grant year, again, it says pre-15, it's not saying 2011. So if I go ahead and put in a drawdown, let me say, uh, maybe I'll draw down the full amount. Let's see what happens. I hit confirm voucher. You can see it's actually assigning it to 2011. Now that's not going to be a sure thing, folks. Um, it could be that that balance in pre-15 was coming from 2012, 2013, 2014. The thing is to remember is if it's coming from that pre-15 money, this is not going to necessarily reflect what, uh, what you input on the funding screen. Again, that's what's changing with grants-based accounting. Um, so that was uh, maybe that's not such a good example. Let me go back and uh, go back to that activity. So I'm going to select Spooner Street again, and this time I'm going to go ahead and put it under the 15. So 36. Well, let's let's do a case where it's split. Let's say you know $500 is coming from 2011, and the remainder of the money is coming from um, 2015. So you can see my total funded amount is 36000 So this would be the one property that's using up the balance of funds, plus it's using up our 2015 monies as well. Let's see what that looks like on our drawdown screen. Now you can see I have two different distinct lines. And again, this information is reflecting what was coming in off of my funding screen. Um, and again, if I specify it from a grants-based accounting uh, year, 2015 and going forward, 16, 17, 18, those funds will be drawn out of what I indicated on that funding screen. Again, pre-15, not the case. If, uh, if it's coming from this line, we really have no control what grant it's coming from. So bottom line, folks, is if you think it's supposed to come out of your 15, make sure it says 15 at this point or going forward again, 16, 17, 18. If it's coming from a pre-15, you really don't have to worry about it. You just want to make sure it says pre-15 and, and not a specific year. So um, let me uh, take a pause here and uh, ask Shauna to see if there's any questions that are coming in at this point. Um, the last question we received um, says, I was hoping you would discuss both program income in home and CDBG. How do we use program income for 2015 for 2015 only activities? Okay, so that's that's a good question. I don't know if we're uh, perfectly ready to uh, to discuss all of that. Let me just say that you know HUD's rule is to use any income you have on hand before requesting additional monies from entitlement or from treasury. Uh, Tina, do you want to uh, to punt on that? Uh, maybe we can cover that under the FAQs, or uh, we have one more webinar scheduled. Are, are we ready to talk about program income quite yet? Uh, 
Not quite yet. Uh, DCED is still working on a policy regarding program income as it relates to grant-based accounting. But you are correct. The current policy is you must use your program income first prior to requesting additional funds from IDIS. Uh, also, I'd like to encourage the grantees to look at the appendix. I can't remember if it's Appendix A or Appendix C, but there is uh, information on program income in the appendix of your Blueback contract. Uh, DCED will be issuing some guidance uh, within the, I won't, won't promise next couple weeks, but it will be uh, within the next couple months for sure. Very and good. Bill, yeah. I have one more as well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And let, let, sure. Let me just add one more thing onto that, folks, and that's um, IDIS is going to treat uh, CDBG program income and home program income a little bit differently. So uh, just be aware of that and be ready for it when uh, when you see it. Go ahead, Shona. I'm sorry, Bill. Um, just to confirm, when funding, do you enter different years under the activity funding screen? So that's a very good question, uh, and the answer is when we're on our funding screen, let me go back to it, is this is going to be pulled uh, from your IDIS setup letter. So the years that we see right here should reflect, you know, you don't necessarily want to go off what's in the contract. Um, if the contract, if the IDIS setup letter um, associated with the contract that you received said 2011, you would want to specify 2011 here. If it said 2015, you would come down to this section and specify and put in the amount under 2015. So this is kind of the end-all be-all. This is what's driving the grants-based accounting and, and it's telling the system what year to apply it to. Um, so. I guess the question would be, if you want to apply it to a contract you got in 2014 and the IDIS setup letter that accompanied that contract said 2011, put in 2011. If you, that 2014 contract you received, the IDIS setup letter with it says 2014, then you would put in 2014. So again, it's whatever uh, is shown in that IDIS setup letter that's really driving this. Um, and hopefully that clears it up. If not, please submit a follow-up question. He already wrote back. I'm referencing okay. that you have to pull some dollars from 2011 and some dollars from 2013 home. Okay, so that that would be uh, in the case where, according to your 2011 contract, let's say you got five hundred thousand dollars under your 2011 contract, and let's say you have just a little bit of money left but not enough to do a full rehab. So um, I'm going to go back to the slides, actually. So in this example here, um, of that $470,000 you received in the older year, you only had uh, $500 left. You had spent or committed $469,500. So you don't want to lose that $500, right? You still want to use that, but it's not enough. That $500 by itself is not enough to fund an entire rehab. So what you do is on your next rehab, in this case 31 Spooner Street, when you get to the funding, you would fund that remaining balance, that $500 out of 2013, and the remainder would come out of your next contract, whatever it happens to be. In this case, it's 2015. So I don't know. Um, there's probably, I guess you could use the IDIS PRO2, the one, the report that, uh, that Tina mentioned earlier, to see exactly how much you have left and remaining on that, uh, in that older year. Chances are, I would imagine that a lot of you have a separate schedule in Excel or some other tracking mechanism to let you know how much you have available under each contract. Um, but yeah, you would want to basically, it, it's, this example is for when you do have a, a, a fellow trainer of mine calls it budget dust. When you have just a little bit of money, uh, but you don't know what to do with it. And this example kind of explains that. 
So uh, again, resubmit if uh, uh, your question if if that didn't fully answer it. But you know, this is going to be again the exception rather than the rule. It's going to be probably one property uh, each year that uses up a little bit of the old contract and then starts hitting the new contract. Any other questions out there at this point, Shauna? Um, not at this time. Okay. So I'm going to uh, to keep going. Let me get back to IDIS. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish this drawdown. So now it's split funded. It's got some money out of uh, 14, some money out of 15. I think that kind of uh, reflects our uh, our example. I'm going to go ahead and create the voucher. So 47359. Whoops, what I did. Oh, got too many fives in there. Let me back one out. And let's say all of the money's been spent. I'm going to go ahead and draw all of it. And generate the voucher. And again, you can see that 2011. Some of the money was assigned to 2011, and some of the money was assigned to 2015. We have no control for that pre-15 what year it's coming from. So don't worry about it. If it's if this is if this number here, if this grant year is different than what you specified on the funding screen, and you funded it out pre-15, no big deal. We don't control it. That's what grants-based accounting has changed. Is if uh, if I funded out 15 on your funding screen, and this is not 15. That's when you should have a problem. Okay, so don't worry about the pre-15s. Um, you should focus on on the 15s and going forward. Okay, so I spent all my money. Now I need to complete the activity. Let me just show you those screens real quick. Um, I would go back to plans, projects, activities, and 47359. Go ahead and edit that activity. So all the work has been done, all the money has been spent. I come into Edit Home Accomplishments. I could put in a narrative. Um, for home, uh, a narrative is usually not required. Essentially, um, they know if, if you proposed a certain scope of work, a certain rehab, you brought it up to code, that's exactly what it did. So you don't have to list out the scope of work here. Um, how many units? This is a rehab, so there was one unit. It was home assisted. Uh, was it Energy Star 504 accessible? Go ahead and answer those if they apply. And then we have three different tabs we need to complete. Um, one regarding um, the location or the property information, essentially lead, lead hazard information. We also have uh, cost data where you have to put in uh, value after rehab and then how much money you spent in terms of home and other funding sources, in this case $36,000. I'm going to go ahead and assume it was a deferred payment loan. And then beneficiary data. And you'll have to provide uh, one row of tenant data for each home assisted unit. In most cases for home on a rehab, that's only going to be a single unit, which is the owner occupied unit. So again, you don't have to tie this information to a specific program year. Um, HUD will count it uh, as a beneficiary based on when you mark it as complete. So um, let me get back to this page. So once I mark this activity as complete, whatever date shows up here, um, that is the year in which the accomplishments are counted. Basically, they're, they're based on whatever completion date is here. So um, those are essentially the three different sections you're going to be, be working with in IDIS, uh, setting up the activity, funding and drawing, which are tied together, and then also uh, the accomplishment data, the completion. And again, those years may be different um, depending on uh, the information in the setup letter and depending on when that activity is actually completed. Um, let me take one more pause for any questions. Shauna, anything that's coming through the door? Okay, on the cost screen, where, you, uh, where would you enter program income or do you not show it there? Oh, very good question. Um, let me go back to that screen. Um, hey, Bill, see that I may interject, we're not quite ready to talk about the program income. 
because we as a state need to enter that in IDIS. So if you can talk about it briefly, but whenever we do get that guidance issued, uh, it will be a little different. Okay, okay. So assuming that you are entering the program income into IDIS and you are actually drawing it, so program income, you, you basically have to do two things with it. You have to receive it into the system. That shows HUD that you have it on hand. And then to show that it's expended, you essentially do a drawdown. So assuming that you did a drawdown to reflect that program income was used on this activity, um, you would actually report it in this section here. You see it says home fund including program income. And that's because the information in this section, and this is homeowner rehab, it's going to be a little different for home buyer or if you do any developments. Uh, it's all going to look different. But essentially the concept's the same that um, the amount of home dollars you spent down here, and this is the total home funds dispersed, it's reflecting that $36,000 I drew, uh, that's going to have to match to the penny right here. So uh, if you have drawn a program income draw against this activity and it's reflected in this amount, then you would need to reflect that program income up here as well. So I hope that answers your question. If the program income was not reflected in IDIS, you didn't do a program income draw against that activity in IDIS, it was just uh, off the book, so to speak, then uh, that would not be reflected in, in, on the screen itself. But again, folks, it seems like things are changing. Um, and uh, you know, just be patient with uh, DCD as they come forward with, uh, with new guidance on program income. Good question, though. Uh, others out there, Shauna? Not this time, Bill. Well, very good, folks. If you do have other questions, again, I just really want to encourage you to get them out there. Um, we only have a couple more slides. Um, let me go ahead and get back to that uh, the PowerPoint. So this essentially just uh, outlines the things that we went through in the in the system. Um, the next couple of slides, uh, and these should be available on the uh, DCED website in the next couple of days. Um, these just kind of lay out um, the screens we went through, and uh, the red highlights kind of the the order in which you do things. We'll also uh, be making available a uh, grants-based accounting step-by-step -step manual. It's about 30 pages uh, that will walk you through how to do this and, again, how to tie it back to the paperwork, such as the IDI setup letter. So, again, this is just to be a, a quick recap. To fund the activity, uh, we went to activity funding. You search for the activity. You can use the project, program year. But you find your activity and you click on Add Edit. You have to differentiate which funding type you're using and then click Add Edit. In this case, we would fund it out of that first account, the SU. On the next screen where, actually, where you actually specify the amount, you need to, again, refer to that IDIS setup letter. Um, if it's coming out of a pre-15 account, such as 14, 13, 12, what have you, uh, use this first section and specify the year. You have to type that in manually. Um, if it's coming from 15 or later, you're going to use the bottom half. And as you receive additional funding sources, such as 16, 17, 18, those will be broken out in a separate line item. And you'll be able to specify which year you want. There will be a, basically a different blank for each year that you have access to. When you're doing your draw, you basically come in here, go to Funding Drawdown, create the drawdown, plug in the number, hit Continue. Again, this is an example of an activity that was funded from split funding. You're using up a balance of the older funds, and then the remainder of the funds are coming from, uh, from 15. And you can do the same thing. Uh, let's say you have a, uh, some money from 13 and some money from 14. Let me just back up a couple of screens. You can actually do split funding within the FIFO layer as well by using this Add Grant Year. So let's say some of the money is coming from 11 and some of the money is coming from 13. I would type in 2011, plug in how much is I want to credit to 2011, then hit Add Grant Year, type, type in 2013, and finish off uh, how much I want to credit to 2013 in that separate line item. So you can do split funding um, across different, uh, within the FIFO layer as well. 
you just have to use this add grant year field or a button I should say okay again here's just a, a, a picture of the confirmed voucher screen um, if it's coming from the uh, the pre-15 we cannot control this year if it is coming from 15 or later on this screen that should carry forward to the confirmation as well okay uh, the accomplishment detail again this is uh, it has to be done within 120 days of the final draw but it's not really tied to any specific uh, program year based on your data entry it's going to be based on when you actually mark the activity as complete so this is just an example of the of page one where you put in a narrative and uh, put in how many units were assisted and then on page two we had to do three sections the location information the cost data and the beneficiary data so uh, time to wake back up folks if you uh, if you've been looking at Facebook or uh, searching through your emails we have one more poll for you uh, for home where do you find the funding year to enter on the activity funding screen is it a use the calendar year of the contract that was awarded to you B use the calendar year in which you are actually funding the activity C use the calendar year when the national objective is met and D use the program year on the IDIS setup letter so Chantel, if you can go ahead and open up poll number two. Okay, the polls are now open. Give you a couple, some time to vote. And about 75% have uh, uh, voted so far, so two more seconds. I'm closing and sharing the results. And 2% voted use the calendar year that the contract was awarded. 2% also voted use the calendar year and when you are actually funding the activity. 0% voted use the calendar year when the national objective is met. And 96% voted use the program year on the IDIS setup letter. Very good. That's what we want to see, folks. Uh, it's, it's really all about the IEIS setup letter. That's going to be the key to when you're doing any type of data entry in terms of setting up your activities or funding them is use that information on the setup letter. Okay, so uh, we're just going to finish up real quick um, on two reports that might help you identify uh, and track in terms of uh, just you know, implementing some internal control in terms of making sure your data is set up correctly. Uh, there's two reports out there that we think will help you. The PRO2 is the list of activities by program year and project. And then there's the PRO5, which is the drawdown report by project and activity. The PRO2, well actually both of these reports are organized first by plan year, then by project, and then by uh, activity. Um, for the PRO2, it's going to help you to make sure that you're basically your setups are are set up based on the, the funding letter. Again, on some of those activities, as Tina pointed out, um, when you look at the project totals, um, they might be a little bit off of your award because um, one activity is pulling from, from two awards. Um, but other than that, it's a, it's a good, nice, simple, easy report to kind of reflect what has happened tied to back to a specific project, uh, i.e. contract. Um, let's take a look at it. So this is what it looks like. I know it's kind of small. Um, actually, this is a drawdown report. Did, did we miss a slide for PRO2? Looks like we have two PRO5s. Um, I'm sorry about that, folks. It looks like we have a PRO5 in place of a PRO2. Um, let me see if I can pull up a PRO2 really quick. Give me one second here. Get a little demonstration on how to run reports.
So this is the PRO2. Just have to add a couple parameters here. I'm going to leave it blank and I'm going to add uh, CDBG and home as well. Now the information, uh, one thing to note about reports is uh, the information is always one day old. So anything you enter uh, today, if you run a report the same day, it will not show up on the report. So the activities, for example, that I added today um, will not show up on the reports until tomorrow. I'm just going to go ahead and make that a PDF. It might be a little be, be able to see it, see it easier on my screen here. And we can close that out and maybe zoom in a little bit here. Oh, maybe too much. Okay. So I'm going to get to the, the more recent years. So let's see. This is what the PRO2 looks like. It's just for CDBG, really. Um, again, those home activities I set up today aren't showing up. But what you can see is we have the plan year over here to the left. We have the project number and the project name, the IDIS activities, the activity names, uh, the statuses, uh, and then funded amount, drawn amount, and balances. Let me see if I can find any of the homes. Okay, here's an example of home where you can see, and I, I'm sorry for those folks uh, who might be breaking some confidentiality rules here, but you can see that, again, uh, you shouldn't be using the person's name, uh, but uh, there, there will be uh, a time where, you know, this funded amount here uh, is not equal to your contract. That's if this last one that's set up only gets partially funded or is funded for more, actually, than... Uh, than was left in the grant associated with 2011. But it's a, it's a nice, simple report. Um, it's just very easy to read, and it, there's not too much uh, ambiguity about it. Let me go back to the slide so you can see the PRO5. So uh, the one thing we want to point out about the PRO5, well, let me explain a little bit. It's a lot like the PRO2, except that for each activity, it's going to break down each voucher that is uh, associated with that activity. So in this case, uh, here's the activity, um, here's the voucher, and it shows you the grant number, in this case, M11. It also shows you the grant year. Um, and the grant year here is not necessarily, if it's coming from pre-15 monies, it's not going to relate back to what you put in here, right? That's what grants-based accounting changed, is when I put in 15, it's going to come on my 15 grant. Um, for all your pre-15 monies, um, if I put in 14, I get what I get. In this case, um, the state as a whole is still drawing down uh, 2011 funds, so it's going to use those oldest monies available first. So. Um, Again, you just want to keep in mind as we transition from grants-based accounting uh, to, to grants-based accounting from first in, first out, um, this report will not reflect grants-based accounting unless it's, it's coming from your 15 year and later. Okay, so uh, just a couple of wrap-up tips, folks. Um, for programmatic questions or concerns regarding timeliness, um, your grant manager is always going to be your first point of contact. Um, and even if you have additional questions about grants-based accounting, go ahead and pass them through to your grants manager, and we'll make sure that they uh, get funneled to the right person, and who knows, maybe we'll get it into uh, that FAQ document that's forthcoming. Uh, for technical assistance regarding IDIS, uh, your first point of contact will be Crystal. Um, so uh, if you don't have their contact information, I imagine you can get it from your grant manager. And again, uh, we have a couple more uh, technical assistance topics coming up or some deliverables. One will be a frequently asked questions, just to kind of cover some of those topics and questions that you asked uh, regarding about how to submit invoices, if it's coming from split years, things like that. So again, we really encourage you to get those FAQs or the, the questions in uh, so we can incorporate them into the FAQs. Um, 
Speaking of questions, um, I believe uh, that's, that's pretty much it for the presentation. Um, and I can go back into IDIS if you do have any additional questions. Um, Shauna, uh, do we have anything coming in through the, the webinar? We do not at this time, but um, we can stand by for five or ten minutes at the most, folks, if you want to type in your questions. We would like to hear from you. Um, and what's the answer, Bill, to 31 um, Spooner Street? That's where the Griffins live from Family Guy. So if there's Two any Family Guy that prints up there. Two people run in with the right answer. Oh, there you go. So, Tina, I think you have to give them some bonus points in the next competitive funding round. Tina, is there anything that you think we should uh, kind of revisit or go back on? Uh, I there will be program income guidance forthcoming. Um, we also will have a webinar at the end of the year on accomplishments and uh, annual reports. Uh, you will also be doing a refresher webinar for all those in attendance uh, once the contracts have been issued. And uh, I'd just encourage that everyone to work on uh, frequently asked questions because those questions will uh, help your coworkers and your uh, colleagues uh, administer the home program. So uh, you could either send them to your grant manager or to me and we'll make sure that we can get that added into the document. So one follow-up question we've received is when will the GBA step-by-step -step manual be available? I think probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think that's what we're shooting for. I could be mistaken, but I think that was uh, that was the idea. Yes, we're currently reviewing the manual now. Uh, we do have a base guide, and we will be tweaking it uh, and as these uh, frequently asked questions come in uh, that I may see what is not necessarily clear and maybe things that we can uh, do better. So. Okay, I guess um, no further questions are in the queue. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, again, uh, if you do have additional questions, please get them submitted, um, and, uh, and good luck with all of your programs going forward.